I mean, personally, I think it's a bop. It's a bop? Bop. B-O-P. A bop. Yeah, he yeah. needed a, a song with some bop in it. I don't know how I feel Let's about that throw. song. After listening to it more than 100 times now, I think. Feels it's kind still of catchy, weird. if you ask me. <laughs> Is it still catchy? I think so. I you, enjoy it. You telling me that makes me feel so much better about myself, uh, about myself and my life. No, but, I really think you should be happy that you were able to compose something that after, at least on Cookie and I's end, 50 plus listens, we're not like, turn it off already. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. good. I mean, there are pop songs that don't achieve that level of like, uh, I don't know, palatability. Mm. Yeah, I feel you. Uh, it's episode 151 of Fancy Ramen. I'm Neil. I'm Cookie. And I'm Scott. And on this glorious February 23rd of the year 2020, we're going to be talking about video games and maybe about arriving to stream late, like me. <laughs> That's only if you want to get into it. I was going to say, whoever was watching the stream before you actually got on heard me and Scott talking about <laughs> waiting for Neil. <laughs> and then Scott goes, oh, Neil's still streaming. Yeah, <laughs> so I know. We both, we both immediately switch over to your screen. <laughs> and then you're like, does this name sound familiar to anybody? And me and Scott are both just like, nope. nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was getting to a really good part of uh, Aviary Attorney, which I, I mean, we could tell I didn't later. I didn't want to interrupt the stream at a point. I was like, ready to find out what happened next. <laughs> yeah, it. it I ended it on a cliffhanger because we definitely were just unraveling the secret to this case or to the trial. That's how you, that's how you get the, that's how, that's how Netflix works. Get those, um, watchers coming back for next week's episode. So I'm curious now for uh, this, this obviously is bad audio podcast. Uh, but when has it been good? But did you <laughs> did you have me call because that would put me in the center of the of the screen? Well, yes, yes, because this is a pre pre built out page that I kind of just guesstimated the locations of things for for future reference. I almost feel like I would be better on a side because I'm talking only to Scott now. I don't talk to you ever, Cookie. His back is turned. It's rude. <laughs> it's okay is this better now oh god <laughs> now, now, now scott. i want scott in the middle and then <laughs> now uh anyways what have you guys been up to this this past week well i made some purchases some buys in my life i ended up um ended up watching a bunch of um this guy who does like a lot of streaming videos and like about how to get your setup and doing things so if you've noticed my lighting's a little bit differently today i actually re-pulled out my uh actual lighting rather than using that lamp that i've been using i am also still using the lamp uh i ended up picking up a i tried to plug in my aver media that i used to have the old capture card and after going through some things, I was like, okay, it's dropping frames. It's doing a lot of stuff. So I went out to the old internet and was like, okay, let's find a new capture card. So I ended up getting the Elgato 60S Plus, which I don't know why people don't talk about that capture card because everyone still talks about the Elgato 60S. The 60S Plus has the 4K and... The 4K pass through along with the, God, what's the thing? Not the RGB, the full color spectrum. What's that thing I'm talking about, guys? Uh, oh, I don't know. I, if we're I talking about printers, talking I can about. go into CMYK, H but that's all I got. It has the HDR. So it's got the, uh, the Elgato S has the HDR plus the 4K pass through. And I'm like, I'm not sure why people aren't talking about this whenever I watch YouTube videos about like, what capture card to use and what streaming things. Everyone's still talking just the Elgato 60S, which came out like six years ago. Well, it could be because the S Plus only came out recently, is my guess. Oh, like within maybe the last year. 
okay, that would make sense. But yeah, so I ended up picking up that and got a deal when picking that up. I also got a Stream Deck Mini for nice and cheap. So now I've got all the hotkeys to switch between my different profiles, uh, recording, pulling up OBS and um, Audacity and everything I need. Just at the touch of a button. So now you guys really don't have to see me struggle with figuring out what six key hotkey thing I made on my computer to switch scenes. And also I'm just also not having to worry about actually seeing my OBS up. And then after doing like two hours worth of research, decided to go with um, not Streamlabs, but Stream Elements for OBS. I ended up liking their, their UI a little bit better. It's a web-based OBS system, so the overlays and things that you use, you design online, and then you kind of just copy and paste them into OBS. So if I was to go into go to Neil's place and want to record using my own elements, I wouldn't have to worry about bringing like a flash drive or anything. I'd literally just log in online, create a new scene, hit copy, paste, and bam, it's all just there and set up for me. I'd have to, of course, move like cameras and things. But that's been my week. Just a slew of purchases to upgrade the stream quality. It's evident. I mean, it's it's definitely uh, the best lighting I've seen in your space. And Neil, did you get a flashlight in your basement? <laughs> 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 Even even commenting on Overknob's thing last week was just like, I can't tell who's talking. You guys really need name tags above your heads. I was like, you know what? Oh, I didn't even notice the name tags until just now. Okay. It's like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put name tags over our heads. Too bad I don't know exactly where everything is, so they'll be adjusted for next week. Mm -hmm. Now that I can kind of see where it all sits. Yeah, we, when we end the stream, we can always keep the call open and let you, uh, let you mess with things a little more. Oh, you're such a sweetheart. Um, but yeah, that's been my week. What you been up to, Scott? Um, as you can see behind me. Oh yeah, this, you got a what couch. What is that? That's a beautiful new couch. Yes, that's right. I took uh, I took the uh, other couch that I bought from um, that I bought secondhand and took it to the dump because no human being should have to be exposed to the like malicious biohazard that was that previous couch and i ended up having someone cut me a sympathy deal for a nice brand new couch so sympathy much, deal sympathy deal like a very huge sympathy deal in which i uh thanked them profusely and then uh spent a fair amount of money on a gift as a thank you because it was still way less than i would have spent i think to get this couch otherwise so, so, so it's not like the salesman gave you a sympathy deal. It's not like, like he went uh, to the back office talking uh, to his manager, making loud noises. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I mean, not to brag, not to brag, but I got connections in this town, you see. And by connections, <laughs> I mean I don't know anyone here, but my, uh, you know, my family someone in my family has lived here for onward to like 60 something years at this point so um a family friend who owns a furniture store was like wow this is the most depressing shit i've ever heard you're an idiot <laughs> here's this couch at approximately at cost uh and uh you know hopefully that will solve your problem and so i i bought them at essentially the cost it was for them to have the couch in the first place and then spent money on a nice gift to say thank you oh my god who wants I'm to going tell to... them they still made a lot of money off of him oh yeah no probably probably <laughs> i know the markups oh i don't think so on this i mean i got it i got it for a killer deal i won't go into exact dollar pricing but uh i mean this this couch is is probably more than triple what uh I had my budget to spend in the first place. And I actually ended up going over budget anyway with the fact that I had to buy this other couch and then take it to the dump and all the like gas mileage and other like favors I had to spend money on. But finally, I come home 
to a nice soft couch. I sit down on it. And because of that, I've been watching a lot of television recently. Um, mm. Yeah, it's been great. I, uh, it's probably true that since I got the couch, I've come home and I've sat on that couch every day, patted it lovingly, saying, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad I've met you. Um, now let's turn on an Amazon Prime original. <laughs> and uh, the newest thing that Sierra and I have picked up with our uh, extending couch time is a show called Hunters that just came out. I mean, it, it like just released. I believe Jordan Peele uh, has some hand in uh, making the show. It's more or less about uh, a ragtag group that is trying to hunt down Nazis in like late 1970s America. Oh, yeah. And it's, I am enjoying it. It's obviously good because after each episode, it's hard for me to be like, well, can I a lot, can I like slot one more hour into what I'm doing? And most of the times I say, yes, yes, I can watch another episode. And so it's definitely hooked me into binging it a little bit a little bit more than I expected, but, uh, it's a pretty, it's it's pretty interesting. I mean, the, the style is unique. There's some like camera work that happens in the first couple episodes. That's really not like something I've seen before with like these interesting, like overhead, like aerial panoramic shots that are happening. I don't know how they necessarily position the cameras to do it. It's, it's really interesting. And then, like in maybe the second episode, there's these like interstitials or just uh, like cuts to sort of surrealist presentation of either characters or themes going on in the show as well. It's, I don't know, it's a little jarring. I don't know if I like it, but it seems like it is sort of uh, its, its own very unique style on how the show is shot. Uh, But it might be worth checking out if you guys are interested. I might have more to say once I finish it, but since I'm in the middle, um, there's not not too much to go into without just jumping straight into spoiler territory. It's got a fairly uh, recognizable cast too. Al Pacino and then um, the kid who played uh, the protagonist in Perks of Being a Wallflower and... uh, the Percy Jackson movies, which I didn't see, but I know they were based off of a popular like children's book series, sort of like, uh, I think it was the generation in between like Harry Potter and whatever is going on now in young adult, young adult literature. What is going on now? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a young adult. I don't, I don't read that. Uh, maybe they're all just into manga at this point. Maybe we've just, uh, light novels. Jumped th- Light Light novels. novels. Okay, that's right. (laughs) Neil is our resident expert on youth literature. Um, And light novels. Actually, truly light novels. But that's about all I've done on the watching end outside of... uh, I watched Cabin in the Woods last night, which... First time? It's Yes, it's one of the most fun horror movies I've ever seen. I don't know why it took me so long to see it. It was an absolute delight. Nice. Yeah. Have you guys seen it? Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. Oh, oh, really? Cookie. Cookie, you got to see it. I, I mean, I, when it came out, what, it was like 2012, I think? It's, it's quite old for a movie at this point. Um, Wasn't it scary? No, uh, I don't think it's scary. Was it trying to be scary? No. No, kind of I don't not. think it was trying to be scary. It's one of the funniest horror movies I've seen uh, in like, recent memory. Like Dale and Tucker versus Evil funny? Uh, yeah, a little bit like that. Uh, I like the premise even better in this one than Tucker and Dale versus Evil, though. Let's put it this way. Um, You're not going to find uh, another movie that has um, such no, an, a scary. unique idea. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. It is, uh, it's a movie to watch, if only to be exposed to the most original horror movie idea I've seen. If this looks, you just said horror movie, but it's really not a horror movie. But it's, it's not. Kind of horror but it's, movie. 
but it's pitched that way. Like it gives it it gives all of the indications, all of the like suggestions that it's going to be a scary movie, but it's not. I think it was so marketed to be a regular horror movie. I could be wrong because I don't really I, go out and watch No, I believe anymore. that's exactly the case. So. Um, so what you're telling me is don't watch it. It's a horror movie. No, no, no watch it. No, you should you watch guys, it. You guys really need to pitch it as like a comedy or something. It is, co- so it far, is a just, comedy. It's a comedy. It's definitely I laughed. a comedy. I, I had a hard time breathing laughing at some things in, the, in that What's movie. it a comedy about? It's a comedy about a horror movie, basically. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay, so think you of it this way. You keep using buzzwords that aren't for me. Think of it this way. Doki Doki Literature Club is a dating sim. Or but it's not a dating novels. sim. Yeah, yeah, but it's absolutely not that. That it's. I feel like it cheapens. Uh, it, it kind of it, it cheapens both forms of media or like both uh, products because you know the people that watch both may or may not intersect that well together. But mm-hmm, it is the mm-hmm. Doki Doki Literature Club of horror movies, if you want to think of it mm-hmm. that way. A truly unique experience. Yeah. It's a maybe. It's a it's a definite. I'd say you should you should definitely uh, you should watch it. Yeah, I th- I think you would like it. Knowing knowing what you and uh, what you and Lizzie uh, tend to watch, I think this falls right under your right in, right into your wheelhouse. Is it anything like um, hiccuping? It's is nothing it anything like, like smile for the runway. I don't know what that yeah, is. I don't know what that is either. It's the latest anime about runway models and it's great <laughs> tell me about this anime about runway models is it kind of like the ballroom dancing is it like a light no. novel but illustrated no so from the few episodes i've seen so far think your god is it shoujo manga shoujo anime that have like the like it's a power level anime shonen With, Shonen, yeah, it's like yeah. a it's a shonen runway sh- model. Shoujo anime. is for is for women, <laughs> for girls. Yeah, you're right. For girls, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't want to be so disparaging towards. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, like, if we're gonna be <laughs> accurate uh, here, okay. So, so it is a anime about a girl who wants to be a hyper model, which is a model that gets featured on uh, Paris Fashion Week, but she just doesn't have the height to be a supermodel and a kid who wants to be a fashion designer, but he just doesn't have the money to go to fashion designing school. And Mm. they make an unlikely duo to make a, to to cause a storm on the anime, on the uh, modeling scene. But like the reason I call it a power trip manga, power trip anime is because literally when she had her picture taken, a supermodel liked her image on like um, Instagram or their version of Instagram. And as soon as the supermodel like hit the like button, like a shock wave of power came out of how much clout that she has. And it went throughout the city. So the entire, so the image went viral, thus getting the girl hired and the guy also kind of hired for their prospective careers. So is there ever a point where like two models are having beef with each other and like they're looking at each <laughs> other's followers on Instagram <laughs> or whatever they call Instagram? Yeah, so their far, influence so far not. are trading blows. <laughs> so far not, but I'm really excited to see when that happens. All I've seen so far is um, one fashion show. So like it was just like a nice little three episode arc leading up to a fashion show so the designer kid was struggling to come into his own working under the master designer and the model chick had to be a step in but she's super short so lots of issues happen with that ah it's great it's wonderful is it's it all funny animation is it like a budding anime or uh, sorry i got dyslexic there is it like a budding romance story too no no, so far he he saw her naked once because she's a model and he was actually helping her dress and he was super shy about it 
at the beginning of the episode, but towards the end of the episode, he was like, okay, I need to make alterations to your dress. Excuse me. And then he's just like underneath her dress. He's like, don't worry. It's dark in here. I can't see anything. <laughs> and she's just like, oh my God, I ran over here. I really hope I don't smell. <laughs> mm. It's it's cute though. That was just like one little scene, but now nah, I'm excited. And we're telling him to watch Cabin in the Woods. I'm starting to regret my recommendation. I know. You know, what can you do? So it doesn't work for me. Ha, I knew it. That's but now nah, nah, it's a new, new, new anime this season called Smile for the Runway. Smile on the Runway. Did you, ever, did you ever finish the ballroom dancing anime? I did. At least to the extent of how far I could get in it. How far you were physically capable of getting because like you were revolted or you had like this feeling of revulsion from watching it or? Or there wasn't any other <laughs> episodes to watch. <laughs> I, I think it's done now. I think the manga is done too. I could be wrong because I know like the okay. manga ka was experiencing a lot of health issues towards the end of what I believe to be the ending. Uh, mm. But I believe it has like officially wrapped up in a neat package and they pushed out the bow tie, the bow tied package, so to speak. Um, okay. And I'll I think to... the manga and anime actually both ended close to the same time too. So if you haven't, it's a pretty good watch. No, oh, no, I have not finished it then. It's, At least uh, I don't think I have because he still hasn't gotten to the main, main event that he was trying to get to. Uh, have, dance. have you met the redheaded woman yet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because that's... We've, yeah, he got a second partner. Or pseudo third partner, because he's danced with the black haired girl before too. Yeah, yeah. So So yeah. Well, his official partner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That I was sure he was going to end the series with. So No, sweet. That's good to know. I didn't realize that that one um finished. I, I, so I will have to go back and continue to whoosh. I kind of want to go back and see if the manga is officially done too, because it, they could definitely like lead on and carry on the story some more to have a little more closure, but it ended on a really good note from what I recall. I believe I'm not full of shit and the anime ends at the same time as the manga in terms of story, which makes it feel a little more uh, neat. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my big problem is you have so many animes that do not go as far as the manga or change the story radically. And then, you know, like those types of things always make me feel a little less sure about the, the series as a whole and any closure I would have. Thanks full metal alchemist. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> make it dig it. Um, Scott, were you finished? Sorry. I, I realized I'm all I interrupted done. you. Yeah, no, I'm okay. all good. So Neil, how was work last week? It was work. I worked a lot. Um, <laughs> you worked, you worked yourself in, into a collared shirt in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, no, I, I've been doing a better job of like managing my work time and basically for, forcing myself to leave when I feel like I'm not being as productive. And I think it's working out a lot better. Um, but I don't really have anything special to say outside of uh, video games. I figured well, as much. Yeah, we've got a full docket. Let's dig into it. Uh, so real quickly, I helped... Artie Strongman, a.k.a. Keith, finished his playthrough of Bloodborne. And I, I feel kind of bad because we sort of did it spur of the moment. We uh, were at the last boss, and I went through all of his achievements to see if he had anything hidden. Mm -hmm. uh, there were any optional bosses. There were not from what I saw. Outside of the most optional of optional bosses, the final boss in the Chalice Dungeon and... Uh, the, oh, the yeah. secret boss ending, which I have not done the Chalice Dungeons yet, and I have not fought, spoilers, uh, Queen Lady Yarnum or whoever the that, does, that name does is. Does that give you a different ending in the game? I don't think it does. If okay. it did, cool, that'd be awesome. But uh, in his case, though, I, I, straight up in that, I straight up asked him, do you have any umbilical cords? Do you have three umbilical cords? Uh, no, he does not. And I'm like, do you want to get the uh, umbilical cords? And he was like, no, I just want to finish it. And I'm like, all right, uh, go, go into, uh, go into the garden and meet German and, uh, make your choice. And he's he, like, yep, go ahead and decapitate me. I'm done. I'm finished. It's all good. So he did choose to resist 
or he refused to be decapitated, which I feel uh, like may be the worst of the two one. options. Yeah, uh, because while we do get a final boss fight, which is you know great, cool, and all, um, the ending, <clears throat> the wheelchair ending, I guess you could say, is also maybe the least satisfying. And I kind of feel bad for not pushing him to uh, to maybe get the slug ending. Yeah, to get the slug ending. But even then, I was thinking to myself that like Keith is someone that left Bloodborne or dropped it, and then only came back to play more of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so like the story is kind of mm, partly there, but not really there. And it makes me really feel like there is a lot of uh, shall we say like like a high bar to cross or like a barricade to actually fully enjoy the story of Bloodborne. Like if you're not fully invested into it and really trying to figure out the ins and outs of what's going on, the plebeian or surface value of Bloodborne story is maybe not that great. Well, yeah, um, it's locked behind the accessibility. Like the good, most interesting ending is locked behind the accessibility of finding three of four umbilical cords and the routes to get those are like some are much easier than others, but some you can stumble upon without even knowing about them. I can, yeah, I can think of two that are easy to find and two that are a little bit more complex to acquire. It's, and, and even then though, like I, I, I almost feel like the cop out ending, which I would argue is maybe depending on your, thoughts of existential dread and wanting to exist forever. Uh, maybe the best ending is letting German, you know, decapitate you, quite mm -hmm. frankly, because you actually wake up from the dream. And if you don't know much about the hunter's dream, uh, like which me looking back now, I still don't know if I fully understand what the hell the hunter's dream is. Maybe awakening from the dream or the nightmare, if you want to call it that, is the best outcome. And maybe that probably would have been more satisfying for Keith, but it's also like you you lose the ability to fight German, and that's a German. It's German. It's a right? fun fight, German. 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 Yeah, Garmin? It, it's a fun fight. Garmin, the speaker company yeah. or stereo company. I thought they made. They also um, do GPS. Oh, G yeah, yeah GPS. whatever. Yeah, I, no, I don't know. Garmin, Harmon, whatever. Um. Oh. There's there's not much more I have to say about it. It, it was kind of weird, though, because I felt that most of the times when you beat a From Software game, you have this heightened sense of uh, accomplishment, anything that like makes it feel satisfying. And I, I sort of feel bad for pig, like piggybacking or like helping him fight that last boss because I almost... I think he maybe didn't get the most he could out of Bloodborne. You can help him in that last fight. You can. You just have to die to him once and then he can then summon the bell. I did not know that. It's too bad that you can't summon, uh, you can't invade people in the hunter's dream because that would be great. <laughs> oh, you think you're in your safe haven? <laughs> not no, anymore. No. That yeah. would probably become the most popular PvP map if it were available. It's a perfect space for it. Yeah, lots of weird tight corners. You could hide places. You could verticality. If only they open up the garden to allow you to yeah. fight more. Yeah. That would be really fun too. Uh, now, that aside, I did play a little more Sekiro because after I got done playing Bloodborne, I definitely felt like, like I know everyone says, and I know we've said that Bloodborne is is fast, but like as I'm playing the game, I'm thinking to myself like Bloodborne doesn't really feel as fast, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on, and if it's because I played a shit ton of Sekiro when that came out. There are some like a lot of Bloodborne enemies. I think part of their speed, outside of um like the obvious, very speedy creatures that are like dogs um, and a couple other hunter-esque characters. Um, they all have speed in the sense that their attacks telegraph faster and land faster than any comparison in a Dark Souls. But the actual like movement of the characters, your ability to say like kite around um, 
you're still like substantially faster than your enemies in that regard. In Sekiro, I'd say that most of your humanoid enemies are moving at approximately the same pace as uh, the wolf if he's not like running or sprinting away. Yeah, that that is... It's a mobility difference. It, it's it's a difference in, mo- in mobility and also regular attacks. So Bloodborne encourages you to just go all in on it. Like if you're not mm-hmm. attacking, you're failing, it feels like, right? Mm-hmm. And it took me a bit to get back into the groove of things when I was playing with Keith. Because uh, like in general, even the saw cleaver or the uh, like the light version of Ludwig's hammer or um, or no, not Lu- Ludwig's hammer, the Kirk hammer or Ludwig's Ludwig's holy, uh, holy sword. Yeah, ho- holy blade. The smaller versions of those weapons or the lighter versions of those weapons are actually pretty slow when you look at Sekiro, where like your strikes yeah. are so fast. But Sekiro wants you to go in and then retreat. Like mm-hmm. it, it's about, a, it's like a call and response. But the game itself is so fast. Like you walking as Wolf is literally the speed that you run in Bloodborne or Dark mm-hmm. Souls. And uh, it was very, it was very weird for me to go back to Bloodborne and experience this very drastic change in gameplay. And I had someone in chat talk about this too, that like, uh, they were talking about how they really wanted the Sekiro style of exploration, but with the payoff of a Dark Souls or Bloodborne. Because really in Sekiro, there are a lot of like random paths you can go down, but for the most part, none of them really offer you that much special benefit. Right. Uh, it, the it, only time I felt that was some secret doors that had like hidden prayer beads. And, yeah. and those are very rare. That was the, I think that's the one corollary between the two. It's like, that's the only time where you feel like, I'm glad that I like poked around against this wall for a little while. The, the only explorative moment I remember being like, whoa, what the hell is this? Is mm-hmm. uh, in the whatever dream, uh, the dream of the past, you go and uh, once you get past like the first initial set of like uh, pillagers and uh like a gateway you get to a bridge and if you jump off the bridge and swim through the water you can get to a a A pagoda right yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. and then there is like the feather item or tool is inside of that and there's a there's a purple guy that will annihilate the hell out of you if you're not ready for him uh and that's like the only time i can think of something being like way off the beaten path and feel yeah. like I got a bunch of reward or like something significant for traveling. Um, Maybe but, the uh, the other snake, the other like blind oh, yes, white yes, snake yes. with its temple. That's the other thing I can think of. It definitely feels like Sekiro was made to be a much more concise game. And obviously I really do miss some of the RPG and choice elements in Sekiro. It still, I think, is my favorite from software game. Uh, going back to it now and playing some more of Sekiro again on a fresh playthrough, I'm reminded of that like I just really like how the action and the gameplay and the fights just feel better to me. They're like more up my style. But mm-hmm. we've I, I've talked a lot about Sekiro. I don't need to necessarily talk about that so much. The one new game I have been playing is AI Dungeon Two, a machine learned algorithm-based text adventure that gained notoriety from a bunch of YouTube troll and joke playthroughs. Uh, AI Dungeon 2 is a free game, but you can uh, contribute to their Patreon. But machine learning proceed kind of procedurally generated in some aspects. What the heck is AI? What? How do you play AI Dungeon 2? Well, it starts you off with essentially a series of uh, a, a choice of genres where you have like one is, I think, custom, but you have fantasy, uh, Western, Western mystery, yada, yada goes on and on. You choose one of any of those and then you might have some choices for classes or jobs afterwards. You choose the job or class and then it you give it your name and then you uh, get a prompt for your your text adventure and uh I think the initial basis of the game is that you'd be able to play it like a very traditional text adventure where it's like, you wake up, uh, you are a knight and you are hunting down a dragon. Uh, you have a long sword and a wooden shield. And then you have to do things like open door, go outside, travel to forest, you know, 
ask barkeep about dragons. But because, uh, and, and so I, I should know, I, I actually played this game for the first time when I saw the very, very first video I'd ever stumbled across on YouTube from a channel called Oni Plays. And it was, it had exploded so much from popularity at that point that the download link for the game just, and or maybe it was even just an online server, it was obliterated, destroyed. It was taken down because it, it basically all of the extra traffic had ruined uh, the capacity that they had for it. So it was being distributed through torrents as a way to like, you know, provide people with the game uh, it, as like a band-aid fix. And I played it and uh, it was good. It was fine. Um, I, I was able to get like a sort a few like fun filled adventures out of it. But since then, like I think a couple months have passed and I think the more and more people shitlord and troll in the game, the game has gotten more or less and less coherent and more and more ridiculous. Uh, Accurate. I've posted. I've also played it. I've posted a few things in our Slack chat where, like the the game would already be so screwed up, even when I just started my prompt. Uh, I'll, I'll pull one up real quick here. Neil, I'm kind I'm of torn one together right now, honestly. I'm kind of torn as a whole because I I thought the idea, the initial idea, was pretty cool. I I like some of those old text adventure RPGs. Uh, now, granted, like I understand that with with a non-scripted game, it's going to be more concise and allow you to do things more in your nature. Uh, so I do like I do like the volatility you get from this. But oh my gosh, uh, one prompt that I, I I literally just started this game. You are Falls, a noble living in the kingdom of Larian. You have a pouch of gold and a small dagger. You are awoken by one of your servants who tells you that your keep is under attack. You look out the window and see a group of orcs charging towards your door. I'll go help my master, you say to your servant, but I'm not going alone. The orc nods and heads off to tell his fellows what you want done with them. I went from, like our, my character yep. went from being a noble to being a servant that tells another servant who happens to be an orc <laughs> something. <laughs> Uh, but it, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, I don't recall the exact URL now, but like a quick search of AI Dungeon Play dot to, AI Dungeon dot IO. It's uh, pretty pretty amazing. You can also just download it off the Apple. You can App Store or uh, Google Play. Is it on Google Play? It is. Oh on yeah, Google it is on Google Play. Play. Yeah. It was a little. I didn't get the. Um, trolley fun that you were getting out of it neil so i had to drop it i was like okay i actually want to get through something kind of coherent i mean i, I wish it had i, I wish it had like too. a toggles i wish it had like a toggle switch of okay let's just turn on all the filter turn off all the filters and let the internet run wild with this playthrough and all right let's Let's do something. Let's do something nice. So I do like the the fact that you can do um, user created dungeons mm -hmm. in it as well. But those are going to be very hit and miss. Yeah, user to user. I imagine not. Not to mention, for that matter, that I believe uh, I believe there is an old version of the game that you can download AI Dungeon One that might not be as we'll say influenced. Hmm. I just started I, one as a ranger, and I'm curious. Like, this might be more serious. We, we shall find out. You are Archibald, a ranger living in the kingdom of Larian. By the way, what the fuck is this kingdom, kingdom of, Larian, of Larian, baby? It's uh, where all adventures start and end. You have a hunting bow and a quiver <laughs> of arrows. You spot the deer, not a deer, the, the deer, deer. The and deer. And are ready to finish your hunts when suddenly you hear a voice behind you. Hello, it says. I am Jarell, but I think we should be friends. You turn around and see an old man with white hair standing there. Okay, see. Wink I at the old think, man. Yeah, I think the thing what that this game of friends? has the most uh, issues with is understanding like your first person subject and then all of the other characters. Like 
it seems like it gets most messy when it's trying to juggle who everyone is. Oh, uh, friendly ones, mm-hmm. he smiles. We're going to be working <laughs> together on some important job soon. Like what, you ask? Jarrell looks down at his feet for a moment before replying. So it doesn't even tell me what he's replying. So now I'm going to say, Jarrell replies, Nazi jobs. Am, am I am I the problem? Am I making it worse? Yeah, I think part Accurate. of the reason it's having trouble focusing is like instead of you playing as a single observer, you're just switching <laughs> to controlling the autonomy of whatever character interests you. But but like in this case, it literally did not it did not give me a prompt to work off of. Like mm. me, the player, would expect him to say what the reply Something. was. So am yeah. I just supposed to say, hey, tell me what you're going to reply? Okay, I mean, what you well, can... spit it out, man. Yeah. What works? Um, All right, can I, I can refer. It, that, that is also it, possible. Here, Neil, Welcome to the I can... Fancy Robin Podcast. We're playing I the... I, AI, AI Dungeon du- I the Dungeon Files. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, Here's, though, like, I, I get your your desire to want something that feels somewhat more authored and more serious. And I used to be able to get that from this game before. But now I think the machine learning process has doomed this to wrong. become yeah. a shit lord, a shit lord like, application. Yeah. It's like people are less threatened by like a robot apocalypse, I think, these days. <laughs> as we realize <laughs> that our brains are truly incomprehensible to even the things we program to operate like our brains. I just did a quick run on I Dungeon the Somnium Files in which I'm Neil, a patient living in Chicago. I have a hospital bracelet and a pack of bandages. I wake up in an old rundown hospital with no memory of how I got there. I take a look around the room and see it's very clean and organized. Am I really Neil? <laughs> is there a bed in the middle of the room? Oh, there is a bed in the middle of the room with a sheet over it. The sheets are white, covered by a blue blanket. On the other side of this bed sits another man wearing scrubs who looks like he has been sleeping for days. Maybe that's Neil. I wake the man <laughs> in scrubs. You stand up and walk towards the bed where you find the man still asleep. He doesn't move or even stir when you approach him. You put your hand on his shoulder and whisper, Neil, wake up. He, he slowly opens one eye as if to say, who are you? I say, I am Neil. <laughs> he nods and says, yes, I know who you are. You're the doctor from yesterday. Granted, I was a patient two prompts ago. I <laughs> nod back at him. That's me. The man smiles and turns his head away from you. Force his head to look back at me. You grab his face and twist it until he looks back at you. He tries to pull away, but you hold onto his face tightly so he can't do anything else except stare at you. His eyes widen in surprise and then they close again. Slap his face awake. You smack his face awake and he lets out a yelp before opening his eyes. What happened? What did you do to me? He asks. Nothing. Just woke me up, you reply. <laughs> oh, well, what was that? what was all that about yesterday? Did you listen to my podcast? I ask. <laughs> he nods and says, yes, I listened to it last night. It was really good. You tell him. <laughs> Thank you. It helped me through some tough times I had. He replies. <laughs> we we would first like to uh, thank the old man for listening to the Fancy Rowan podcast. Um, my serious prompt yesterday, or one of my serious attempts, was trying to fight a dragon. But like within the the middle of the prompt, <laughs> that was so much. Yeah, fun. Scott Scott is like dying because it was great. Uh, the prompt <laughs> is. You are Neil, a knight living in the kingdom of Larian. You have a steel longsword and a wooden shield. You are on a quest to defeat the evil dragon of Larian. Larian again. You've heard he lives up uh, up at the north of the kingdom. You set on a path to defeat him and walk into a dark forest. As you enter the forest, you see a large black dragon sitting on his throne. He looks down at you as if he uh, he's waiting for an order. Which what? The it's next a ring day, fit order. The next day, you wake up with no idea what time it is. It's morning, but your alarm didn't go off until noon, so you're still asleep. And there we go. Uh, it's 
it's as much a game trying to get trying to get the game back on track Mm -hmm. that uh one of my prompts is literally uh realize i am in a fever dream caused by the dragon wake up to see the dragon oh wake up to see the black dragon in the dark forest and ready my long sword that's what i prompted in and it says you wake up and look around there is nothing except darkness and silence your eyes adjust to the darkness and you can uh, now see clearly a black dragon sits on a, dra- a throne made of bone holding a human or excuse me holding a sword, a sword. made from human skin <laughs> and so, so Neil's follow up to that is like I swing my sword at his human skin sword and obviously <laughs> cut through it <laughs> and the game's like your sword does nothing against the human skin <laughs> you swing your sword at the dragon's head but it doesn't even move you try again but this time you manage to hit the dragon's eye instead this causes the dragon to flinch and fall off his throne I choose swing sword at fallen dragon. You swing your sword at the dragon's head, but it doesn't even slow down. The dragon falls off his throne and onto the ground. You stand over him as he bleeds out from his nose and mouth. Well, that was fun while it lasted, which I'm assuming is what my character says. And so then I choose, it's like, okay, we're, we're making progress. I need to cut off the dragon's head and then take it back to the kingdom to show I <laughs> to show that to show that I killed it, right? So I I type in cut off dragon head for uh, for a trophy. The game's reply: you you <laughs> you grab the dragon's head and slice it off. You put the severed head on a pike and eat it. You eat it. Yep, that's. That's the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's a delight. I think it's worth everybody's everybody's time to at least do like one or two of these and have fun with it. It takes and, five minutes tops. And try to be serious if you want to. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. No, I really tried. It, at the end of the one I just read to you guys, um, after he said thank you, it helped me through some tough times I had. He replied after listening to our podcast. I said, "Are we both Neil?" I ask in a Tyler Durden situation. He nods and says, yeah, we are. <laughs> well, that, well, let's get along then, you say. <laughs> sure thing, Neil, he responds happily. A few hours later, you leave the hospital and go home. You feel better now than ever. Ta-da. It's, I mean, solving these is not so bad. The end. Yeah. What have you guys been playing? Well... I found out a lot of, about a little indie game called Florence by, oh God, uh, Annapurna Interactive? Anuprieta Interactive? Annapurna <laughs> Interactive. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of picked it up on a whim. I had enough um, Nintendo points from buying other things to where this game was just free. Didn't know anything about it. Just saw the um, initial character design and thought, oh, this seems nice. Let's go ahead and try it out. I was in for an emotional ride, guys. It's a, uh, turns out, only about a 30 minute, 30 minute game, quote unquote. It's got some really nice, neat features. If you YouTube it or Google it, you do see that a lot of people just have like just straight playthroughs of it, which I didn't realize people still did because wasn't there like a lot of controversy around that other game that was kind of just an interactive thing by a small studio that was like 20 or so minutes. People would play through the entire thing. Then the studio did, never actually got money for it. No Man's Sky? What game was... No, no. They got, they got paid. No Man's Sky. They got paid. <laughs> I'm not uh, sure which one you're. Yeah, I don't remember to. either. Was it the? It was one of those games, but this is kind of in a similar state of small indie developed short story, uh, interactive narrative type game. Only a couple of bucks, I say, rather than watch a YouTube video about it or watch a YouTube video playthrough of it to play it. It's got some really. Nice and interesting thing. So the general story is you're this girl named Florence going through 
part of her young adult life. It seems somewhere outside of college-ish. So she's doing her day-to-day job. She meets a person and lives her life. Uh, It's got a really cool aesthetic of how it flows. So a lot of the game is played by just like scrolling down through just still images through like doing like comic book panels of she's walking down the street. Here's a comic book panel of her walking down the street and then you'll get like a little animated section to where you actually have to physically push your cursor over to walk down said street. Um, yeah, there are a couple of like things that happen in the game that made me like really, it like clicked for me at a moment because she ends up meeting a guy in the in the game and when they're having their first conversation to have the conversation you're just doing like putting together puzzle pieces of empty text box text boxes text bubbles and so the puzzle puzzles start off complex quote unquote complex they're like eight piece puzzles and the more you talk to this guy as the character the more the conversation starts to flow for you so instead of it being an eight piece puzzle to put together this speech bubble it's now a four piece puzzle so you're quite literally just putting together the corners comes a three piece puzzle and the game kind of just kind of flows like that it's i'm doing this game no justice it's very beautiful had me going through an emotional roller coaster and just it's 30 minute playthrough well worth it well worth it that's all I really have to say. I'm sorry. Goodbye. I've seen it on Steam. It was, uh, it was, I don't know if it was just like advertised because it was on sale or if it was actually just released there. But yeah, I saw it. Um, 30 minutes. Do you think that's enough to fully like become attached to the characters and appreciate the story as a whole? Or did you find some like, common ground with the protagonist. I mean, despite like obviously being a different gender and of a different age (laughs) and so forth. Race. Um, um, I think it's just short enough to where you can kind of get a good grasp and sense of the character because like the first couple of minutes of the game is you going through the character's day-to-day life. Like everything is a chore. So there's literally a little mini game for you brushing your teeth, going to work, um, going through her like Instagram feed or Facebook feed. And then as you play the game more, like you get, you get to know the character and what's going on in the character's life. Then things happen. And at least me, I got emotionally attached to it because I was like, Oh, this is cool. This is kind of where I am at in life right now. And then it's like, oh no. Um, plot twist. This thing is happening now. I don't want to give away any of the story. Mm-hmm. It's literally a 30 minute story. Uh, but everything's done using, I think the only time words are ever used is to introduce each of the chapters. And the main character has a conversation with her mother to where you don't get to hear what your mother is saying, but you've got a set of like two different prompts that you can pick. How different are the prompts? Are they, are they like, no, I did not kill our father or my father. I did not kill dad. And no, then they're things like, hi, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> it's like you can choose between I'm fine. I've been busy. Um, no, you don't have to find me a boyfriend. I'm just at work. Uh, I'll call you back later. How's the day been going? Things like that. You can also choose to ignore the phone call mm. when you get the prompt for it. Are there a number of different endings? I do not know, and I do not think so, but maybe. Maybe. I'm going to have to play through it again. Is the game trying to make you believe there are different endings? 
No. Mm-hmm. Cleese, there aren't any words, so I guess the only way to find out is to make ever so slightly different choices in the few areas at which it's not just a story going through itself. So there totally could be. I could totally... It kind of seems like the game itself is you being just like a passive observer then. Like even if you make choices, they don't actually have any impact potentially. And so... You're just a part of this girl's thing in a part of this girl's life just watching it happen and interacting in certain ways to where the way you interact with the character Mm -hmm. is more interesting in some aspects than the actual story itself Mm -hmm. god because i really don't want to like give anything away yeah no especially if it's a you know a 30 minute game like if it keeps you entertained and engaged for the whole 30 minutes, right? If you feel like the time just kind of flies by, it's sort it's sort of uh, achieved its purpose, right? Yeah, and it's nice and cheap enough to where I didn't really feel as if I wasted the lack of money that I spent, but even if I did buy it with actual cash, mm-hmm. I enjoyed it enough to where I'm like, man, Lizzie, you've got to play this game. This was the things that it did during the playthrough with itself were interesting enough like oh that's a really good way to symbolize and represent that oh no oh no this is not good this is this is not good what's going on oh no oh things are getting worse no no okay okay to complete this game ha (laughs) types of situations happen okay just to that was literally me while we were at a trampoline park yesterday because I didn't want to spend twenty dollars to jump on the trampoline. Wait, did you say it was free? No, no I paid. I ended Three. up getting it for free because I had because I had um, Nintendo coins. Nintendo does this things. Okay, when you buy a Nintendo game, you get coins if you did it digitally, or if you get it physically and register it. I just happen to have a couple of coins, a couple of dollars worth of coins, and I was like, you know what? I like the way this looks. Click. I get you. I get you. So I didn't realize it was going to be like a 30-minute game, so I beat it in two play sessions, two sitting sessions, kind of just getting a nice introduction to it, and then playing a little bit later, then I was like, oh, I finished it. I didn't want it to end here. Okay, I guess I guess this is where it ended. And then I started like looking up more information on it, and I saw all the YouTube playthroughs, and they're quite literally just 30, 31-minute videos on youtube does this make you interested at all in similar games uh, that maybe don't have the same aesthetic or emphasis on aesthetics but something like uh there are two games about aol instant messenger why are there two they made a sequel Uh, One second. I'm going to fact check myself on the the name. AOL Instant Messenger Game. It's uh, called Emily is Away. There's an Emily is Away 1 and there's an Emily is Away 2. Hey, I think I've heard of that. But these are similar sort of like, I hate to use the term casual games, uh, but I think one could apply that label if they wanted to. Now, granted, this lacks the aesthetic beauty that you'd have in Florence, but it's another like sort of short, maybe 30 minute to an hour type of game that may or may not be available on uh, iOS and Android. I, I would be surprised if it wasn't available in those because it seems like it'd be the perfect type of game to, you know, put it on, like something you could play casually uh, whenever. I will have to give it a check out. This one's going to be a lot more text based. Oh yeah, for uh, sure. Florence, Florence literally had me not reading anything. Yeah, besides, yeah. I guess I just like I, three or four prompts. I see a parallel I, between these types of games because they're ones that you can consume within like a short duration of time. And despite not having text in Florence, I imagine it's a very speci- very specifically a narrative or story driven experience as opposed to something that is mechanically driven or gameplay based. 
Yes, yes, very much so. To where you're like, oh, nice. Plays with plays with and toys with a bunch of different ideas. But no, I'll have to check this out because I like I like bite sized short things. Too many people are wanting 120 hour plus video games nowadays. Too many people want Monster Hunter. I enjoy myself some Monster Hunter. Ooh, maybe that's what I should start streaming. Eh, doesn't matter. Anyway, that's kind of what I've been playing ish. Besides that, I've been just doing a lot more um, Slay the Spire. Mm. I've been watching some Love friends stream card game. Oh, and I've been playing a lot more Children of Morita. So, what you been playing, Scott? Um, since we recorded last, I completed Star Wars uh, Fallen Order. And what you think of that ending? So, uh, I guess large, massive, enormous spoilers ahead for probably less than two or three minutes here for anybody who wants to play the game and enjoy. Oh, wow. Neil, Neil, Neil doesn't want to play this. Neil just doesn't give me want the thumbs the up when you're done. Okay. Cause I might play it. Who knows? Okay. Well, so then I guess I should ask you, Scott, my first question is, did you enjoy how throughout most of the game, everyone's like, what we're doing is right. We should really collect and get these names. And then the one character who just comes on board, it's like, maybe you shouldn't. Are you? Sh- yeah. yeah. It's like, are you sure this is a good idea? The way, are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> the way that they bring that character into is like one of my many gripes as to how this story writing is. Uh, well, let's be honest. This story, right? The story writing for this game is no no worse, um, but I also don't think certainly any better than like the content we've gotten from the Star Wars franchise in the movies, at least for quite a while, right? I I'm, I won't go. I'm gonna. Oh, go ahead. I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say a little better. Yeah, may, maybe even a touch better. I'm, I'm I'm gonna say before the Mandalorian, this was one of my favorite um, Star Wars stories. Okay. I'd say outside of the Mandalorian, <laughs> I have not enjoyed any sort of Star Wars like media uh, <laughs> in a long, I guess, a there long were, time. Because, because obviously you've got the Old Republic, but that was mainly just a. <gasps> oh man, that's you're the bad guy. Uh, Crazy. Yeah, if, old Republic spoilers. Well, no, I think the Old Republic. It might be partially because I was younger, right, and I was more willing to absorb like the lore and whatnot for those games. I I felt like they had a lot. I enjoyed Knights of the Old Republic. I did not play enough of Knights of the Old Republic two to have an opinion on it, but it's a it's a like well-loved game by the community. So I'm not going to like step on any toes. I even enjoy, yeah. I think we've all talked about how we've enjoyed the, uh, all of the star Wars games that came out during our childhood in the, you know, like PlayStation two GameCube era. Um, there was some good yeah. stuff that came out. Yeah. Even like PlayStation three, Xbox 360 era, but past that, you know, they've, I guess the force unleashed wasn't, terrible i didn't play those so i once again can't like speak to it but i do have a cousin who enjoys star wars star wars quite a bit and said the force unleashed were like really uh pleasant games to play long story short (laughs) though uh the story writing for this game it is if you're happy with the quality that exists now you're not going to find anything wrong with this one but if you're (laughs) me you're gonna find plenty of things wrong that are just like frustratingly simple or uh they don't make like they just don't make very much sense for instance our gal who we bring on board who we become besties with um just like shortly after the pacing of uh, shortly after crashing on uh dathomir not crashing on dathomir landing on dathomir landing on dathomir, running dathomir, around you don't crash uh yes she is the only other sentient being there so i can see why she would want to leave But the fact that she goes from um, being like completely, uh, like completely diametrically opposed to your goals from the start, and within probably an hour and a half of gameplay, is just like, yeah, actually, I think we could be best friends, and it'd be super cool. You should also listen to my counsel this whole time. Uh, you've been slaughtering mm-hmm. all of my like kin, but like that's no big deal, obviously. Um, 
you know, let's not worry about that. I also have very convenient magic for moving the plot forward on the rest of the game. Like, whatever. I like her character. I don't understand how she, like, actually falls into... We never thumbs up, Neil. Yeah, we, we never, never did thumbs up. up. Uh, <laughs> but long story short, there, there are tiny little complaints I can make for all sections of the game. Uh, the only... The, the remaining spoiler thing before I give Neil and everyone else the thumbs up is... Damn, it felt good to see Darth Vader bust in there, start kicking ass. Like, I will say that this game disappointed me most of the way through, but I was incredibly uh, surprised and satisfied with the introduction and just absolute, like, shitstorm that was Darth Vader busting in and then uh, trying to prevent himself from getting wet at the end of that, uh, like, chase scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that was pleasant. That was pretty good. And, um, man, I wish there could have been a little bit more, like, boss fights because those were... They were clunky, but they felt like the most satisfying part of the combat out of the game. But anyway, that was... Could you fight the ninth and the seventh sister, right? The second and the ninth, yeah. That was second and ninth. Yeah. But yeah, but they couldn't really introduce more, more sisters. bosses because everyone was kind of spoken for and you, at yeah, the time. And you keep getting interrupted as well, like during your fights. So you fight the second sister like three times or something. And each time it's just like, ah, uh, yes, we're going to interject halfway down this person's health bar, which is good because they don't have enough depth in their combat for it to be fun for you to go that other half of the health bar anyway. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but I think we're done with spoilers. I'm going to thumbs up Neil back in now. He's slowly putting the head. Oh, I back. guess I never, I guess you never told me what you thought of the end. <laughs> I didn't, but that's okay. Uh, cause I can still what? say that without spoilers. I think that the choice that was made was totally reasonable. No, Neil, you're fine on this. I'm not. No, but rather I was saying, like, was it a good ending? Did he feel satisfied? Did all of the jank in the game earlier become justified by the ending? No, that's all a big thumbs down. But uh, <laughs> I will say that, like, wrapping up wrapping up the game's uh, ending, that like the ending of what I thought was a really mediocre story, it was at least a good wrap-up. I was pretty satisfied with that. So, like, credit where credit's due. Even if I didn't enjoy the journey... I at least like thought that the ending was sensible. And um, for someone who may have enjoyed the journey, probably I, I hope that they would be satisfied and happy with it as well. And well, what it was I, the only ending they could do. Yeah, exa- exactly. There really was no <laughs> other way to work it. Um, and, and I will say, which I, I told Cookie during the spoiler part, but I can keep it spoiler free. The last, like the last couple moments of the story, they really did understand how to wrap up a climax really well. I enjoyed that too. So, like, even if I didn't give a shit through, you know, 90% of the progression, the last 10%, I was like, this is kind of cool. I'm interested. I like how they've like set all of this up. I'm just sad that I didn't enjoy any of the game up until this point. Uh, question, what difficulty were you playing Oh, I on? played on Padawan. I mean, I played the easiest uh, combat possible Sweet. because it felt... So we... It just felt so clunky. It, it felt really uncomfortable to actually do the combat. And so I didn't want to get increasingly frustrated with higher difficulty and... Um, I guess I higher difficulty and, and like worse responsiveness. I, I would be more frustrated by the lack of like responsiveness or fluidity in my controls. Yeah. Sweet. I'm glad we both played it on the same difficulty level then. It makes me feel a little more accomplished. Well, it just made me think like the, the reasoning I had for choosing that Padawan level where it's like, God, oh, your parry or I think it's parry. Like your parry window. Yeah, your parry frames are, increased. your parry window is you're phenomenally big. Yeah, your damage, it's its almost too big, but it still feels like very clumsy you in the timing. You still miss the parry. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's the thing. It's like when you tell me that, oh, this parry window is huge and then I still can't parry, I'm like, so is there a way that they are just like not telegraphing? I, I just think other games telegraph like when you're when you're successful at executing something and when you fail at executing something versus when something is impossible 
Like, <laughs> you know when you can't parry a move in, uh, like, Dark Souls or even... Enemies flash red. Even in Bloodborne. Well, in Sekiro, right, they do have that, like, red flash where it's, this is unblockable attack, and they do the same thing in the Force, uh, or not the Force, sorry, Fallen Order, which I like. I think that's a cool mechanic. I hope that continues in a lot of games. That telegraph of like, you need to dodge or do some sort of like m- avoidance of this because you can't block it. In Sekiro, there are moves that are actually, that say they're unparryable, but if you actually have a thrust attack hit you and you parry with perfect timing, you can actually perfectly deflect. Like you can perfectly deflect an attack that it tells you you can't, you can't uh, guard through it, which is pretty cool. I don't think that's the case for this game at all. I, I tried a couple no. times. There's obviously no distinction on those ultimate moves. They're very different from, I think, also uh, a game like Sekiro where you have three indicators of like sweep, stab, or grab. In this one, it's just flash red, and then they'll execute a cool animation that you need to sidestep. Like you, you always have to sidestep it. There's no... Uh, greater intricacy. You could theoretically jump out of the way by just getting your character model, like your hitbox out of that area. But it's not... But then that's going to look weird. It, yeah, it would be jank, even though it would work. So, yeah, Padawan mode. I mean, like, did you feel like you were ever able to parry competently or you understood exactly what the, like, what the optimal strategy for say blocking and attacking on certain enemy types was because with ranged characters in Padawan mode, you just deflect their blasters back at them. Like it's nearly effortless, but when it comes to fighting any sort of melee enemy, especially enemies that have like fists or bite you or like are (laughs) doing something that's more bludgeoning than like, I guess the little stun baton sort of like, weapon-based combat. I found it unintelligible the whole time playing the game, exactly how that worked. No, I could see that. It definitely felt better when you were fighting the uh, bounty hunters and are the badass all-in-black stormtroopers, Mm -hmm. because I can't remember what their names were. Yeah, the Inquisitors. Yeah, that's the only time that the game felt okay. And then even then, it was it was just weird, like not exactly understanding what is and what isn't parryable. Because there definitely... Uh, there seemed to be moments in which the parry window was incredibly forgiving for a lot of like initial attacks. But if they started a combo, by like the third or fourth swing on those uh, like scout trooper commandos... There was, I never had any success parrying it. And I don't know if that's because I was getting stun locked or what, but I didn't, I never understood the combat from start to finish. So it could be my flaw and not the games. I can take it. Well, it's fine. As we said during the spoiler section, this was on par with other Star Wars stories. Yeah, equivalent and quality. When you come to a Star Wars game, to be a Jedi, no. To experience a Star Wars story, of course. And Neil's furrowing his brow in a way that I think is appropriate because it's... Yeah, I, ju- I just <laughs> don't know, after all's been said and done, what a Star Wars, what a Star Wars story actually is. Oh, it's a call to adventure from a young boy who doesn't quite... Or know that he's a Jedi. Or a young girl. Nah. <laughs> Sorry, Ray. Apparently. Pe- oh, people yeah, don't seem to like that. I think you still need to have... The, the most diverse you can get is a white man with red hair. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, actually, no. Everyone was on the Ray bandwagon until um, the actress said that she did not have more privilege than um, Guy Boriaga. Bori- oh, oh uh, John Boyega. <laughs> You mean Finn, yeah, who John. gets fucked over so hard yeah, in he the second fucked. movie? <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. His, uh, or his uh, Asian co-star, who essentially becomes set dressing in the third movie. But whatever, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. want to go into <laughs> PC politics of Star Wars, because I don't give a shit enough to like fight for that. 
<laughs> what I can I, say is I yeah. was disappointed that they weren't able to execute what I thought was good premises on their story beginnings. Because I don't know how you feel about this, Cookie, but our character not learning new force stuff, but instead like unburying forgotten skills through like as he learns to cope with trauma is a really cool concept. I like the concept oh, a lot. And- I just think they didn't yeah. do a very good job with it. I think what was especially disappointing too, and it makes this game seem like perhaps it was rushed. Maybe there was some sort of indication as though like it was either rushed or the team working on it wasn't as, uh, I think as comfortable with this particular medium uh, as maybe <laughs> another company would be. Because what I also see is these cutscenes in which some of your like some of your uh, role model figures are supposed to be doing something very badass, and it's animated so poorly that you can't like I can't actually line up the swing of a lightsaber to deflecting a blast. Instead, it just looks like magnetically five feet in like five <laughs> feet away from this spinning lightsaber, a blast just gets repelled back at someone or a slice like goes over their head and then they clutch their stomach as they fall. Like there were some times in which they had these animations executed very well. And so that's what pushes me towards this theory of like rushed or in incomplete. Like the game was incomplete in its uh, final stages. Yeah. In, in being <laughs> polished. Um, because there are moments in which there are these cutscenes that are that are very good looking, and even on my PlayStation, which was grinding on certain loading screens, and I really do think that even to enjoy this game, it's probably best to play on the most recent consoles and not try and um, get by with just a standard PlayStation or Xbox One. Oh yeah, no, your standard PlayStation, Xbox One, or garbage. Oh yeah, I could. I had like there was like sometimes a minute lag to where I'd start loading finer textures. And so Sierra and I were like walking through an area. I was like, what is this big brown streak, do you think? And so I stood (laughs) still and waited for it to develop (laughs) further and further and get more textures and and like resolution. I was like, oh, it's a mud puddle. Okay, (laughs) it could have been a tree. I honestly can't tell you. (laughs) Um, So (laughs) it was a frustrating experience. I wished I, I wanted it to be better. I think people that enjoyed it, though, there are good games like it out there that do a lot of the things that it does just better. All these tunnel crawling scenes and puzzles, like I had more fun with those experiences in the most recent Tomb Raider games. I think they did a better job with it. The like climbing and platforming stuff, Almost any game does a better job at, actually. I was not a fan. The wall running was a cool idea, but it felt also incredibly clumsy. Um, and then the, the combat oh, itself. The sliding? Did, did you enjoy the sliding? No, segments? the sliding, actually, the sliding <laughs> drives me nuts. Every time that the sliding was introduced, I was furious, like absolutely fuming. It's such a stupid mechanic. Um, it's so slippery. There was no point to it. Not precise at it all. It was imprecise, and yet it wasn't challenging. It just felt like, oh, hey, sliding would be cool, wouldn't it? Um, and that was the depth of thought that went into that. Haven't done this since 2002. Let's yeah. go. So, so the game tries to take a lot and throw it together and see what sticks. And I just think the problem is it's not much of it sticks at all. Um, and that's <laughs> Star Wars Fallen Order. The second Fancy Robin podcast review of it. Mm-hmm. Mine was not as scathing. No. I don't want to be a hater. I feel like I bring all this negative energy into the podcast. That's okay. As, as the white one, you've got yeah, to. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. That is my privilege <laughs> to just uh, complain and, and see, uh, you know, absolutely no retribution it's, for it. It's 2020. It's your year. <laughs> Again, <laughs> 20, 20 years in a row. Um, I, I don't know if I have anything else to say. Do you have anything that you want to springboard off of or, or counterpoint on, Cookie? I'd love to hear more of your opinion now that I've gotten my, my furious word soup out. Nope. Still the same thing of they had a very big missed opportunity with the naming of the... Um, 
with the naming of the difficulty levels should have been flopped <laughs> swapped over should have been swapped i, I think that makes sense because as a padawan in padawan mode you think oh your character is a padawan they're going to struggle with everything jedi grandmaster not going to struggle with anything but now nah, the year all of your criticisms are exactly on point it's got some cool moments. Still one of the better better Star Wars stories mm-hmm. that has existed. And likable characters, in a long, long I guess. Time. That's another thing. I actually I enjoyed all of the characters introduced. The way that they were used maybe in the writing was clumsy in a lot of ways, but your your mentor seer, very interesting concept of a character, the uh good guy turned bad guy theme that is so like present in star Wars um, of, is it Trilla? I think it's Trilla. Interesting though. Maybe not handled. uh, Actually, I don't know. I think maybe she had a more interesting or enjoyable backstory than say the Adam driver, uh, Ben Kenobi character of the movies. And then uh, grease your pilot. Uh, I thought he was just likable. He was very fun. A four-armed Joe so Pesci he, is, as a pilot, is about as good as it gets. <laughs> um, and he liked his botany. Yeah, he liked his botany. It. That was fun, too. So, good characters. Story didn't do him justice. Gameplay certainly didn't do that any justice, either. All in all, Fancy Rama gives an official two and a half out of five. Will not play. Again. I'm. I would give that game a two out of five. I don't think it's an absolute. Well, I was giving it. Five. I was giving it a three. Oh, okay. Okay. I see what you're doing. So it's a fancy ramen two and a half. We'll see where Neil puts the scale. Maybe I won't <laughs> even play it. After oh, Neil! All but these after things. I, after I, you know, save the spoilers. I did tell Cookie though. We'll see. I did tell Cookie that the last ten percent, or like just the the wrap up of the game, there's a twister moment or two in there that are, like. If you do not play it, you should look them up just for fun because they're wonderful. Um. Okay. Okay. Sweet. Well, I'm going to go see a Harlequin about a movie. Uh, are you going skiing next week? Next week, yes. Okay, so that so is when I, we are going Somnium to do our I, the Somnium Files spoiler cast. <laughs> it won't be on stream either for that matter. Yep. Won't be on stream. It will not be on stream. I don't I'm know how to do a it. sad air horn. <laughs> no, it's. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> I like to keep consistency here. If we're going to stream the podcast, we should just keep doing it on Cookie Skim Milk, I think. Agreed. And okay, send some fine. love your way, too. You've done a lot more work than I have regarding this uh, podcast. So, And both Anyways, of you guys that- have done even more than me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was episode 151 of Fancy Ramen Podcast, the Fancy Ramen Podcast. Uh, if you have comments, questions, or corrections, you can write into podcast at fancyramen.com. I say it fast so you don't email in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you uh, Go ahead. No, after you. All right. You. you can uh, find us streaming all over Twitch. We're at uh, twitch.tv, Fancy Ramen TV. Uh, Cookie streams the podcast at uh, Cookie Skimilk, K U, not K U, C U K I S K M I L K. And we have our buddies um, at Artie Strongman, separated, each word separated by an underscore, and J Frey All Day. Uh, Who went the complete opposite route and didn't separate anything. anything. Yeah, I actually like the J Frey All Day (laughs) better with the uh, lack of underscores. It's easier to say. It's all the wise. But J Frey it's all, all the day. J Frey all day. Yes. But um, I do appreciate Artie Strongman's stream because that's the only one I've actually watched. Um, and they believe I'm actively trolling when I give good advice on Bloodborne. So. Hey, maybe try using a blood vial to heal. <laughs> no, man, he's trolling you. <laughs> <laughs> I told him to use a hand lantern in a dark area, and someone's like, I think that drains your health. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, John said that then. That's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, 
don't hesitate to like and subscribe us on YouTube. Telling friends also helps our channels grow. <laughs> you may find me on Mixer soon ish maybe probably not no you won't never mind i've i've already stopped that endeavor on mixer really yeah i was thinking about doing a going like completely opposite of neil and going mixer and as that well. is like a, that's a new modern dating service similar to tinder hinge bumble okay cupid yeah it's basically the the christian mingle to bumble as so Christian Mingle is Mixer and Tinder is Twitch, I guess. Mm, okay. You can find me uh, <laughs> at uh, Scott Trickett, Only Farmers. Oh. <laughs> 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 have a good All week, right. everybody. Okay. Yeah, have a good one. See you next week or hear you next week. The stream is ended. The stream has ended. Do 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 do